you may have noticed that there are some people who seem to be able to have a, a, a positive, a cheerful attitude no matter what circumstances they're facing. I think of Farmer Frank, who was sitting peacefully on his roof during this huge flood. And as he sat there, a neighbor in a boat came by and yelled, Frank, your, your fields are washing away. Yep, Frank replied, but grain prices are so low, I'll get more money from insurance than I would have harvesting. And all your animals are washed away too, the neighbor lamented. Frank replied, I know, but the ducks and geese can swim. Uh, I see the river has risen above the windows of your house, Frank. Well, that's all right, he replied. Those windows needed washing anyway. Uh, the neighbor asked, nothing gets you down, does it? Frank replied, no, you know, I'm such an optimist. If I fell off this roof into the water, I I'd crawl back up and I'd check my pockets for fish. Now, whether you thought that was funny or not, I think we would agree that there are very few people, very few people who have an attitude like that. Because there are things that happen, there are th uh, things that occur that seem to make it impossible to be optimistic or joyful. If your best friend is killed in a car accident, if the doctor says your spouse has cancer, if your dad tells you that he and mom are getting a divorce, or if you get a notice from the power company saying they're going to disconnect because you haven't paid the bill, in those type of circumstances, it's very difficult to have a cheerful attitude. Yet I believe, as Christians, we have reasons for joy even in the darkest times. Even in the most difficult circumstances, we can be sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And let's pause and pray the Lord would help us understand and experience that type of joy this morning. Oh, Father God, thank you for the Bible, the Word of God. We pray that it would uh, be truth that enters our minds and hearts today and enables us, Father, to find in the midst of our affliction a reason for joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, I would submit that the Apostle Paul had, uh, like Farmer Frank, had a remarkable attitude in the midst of affliction. Uh, we have not focused on this in previous sermons uh, on Ephesians, but... As Paul sits down to write this letter, these books, he is not sitting in a leather chair beside, behind the big oak desk with a lushly carpeted office. Where is he? <laughs> in prison. Paul is writing from prison. We're not sure what, what the accommodations were like. It appears he may have been under some type of house arrest, but we can be certain that it's still a very unpleasant environment. And it was extra difficult because Paul had no idea if and when he would be released. Uh, we do know he, he is freed about two years after composing this letter, but as he's writing, he has no assurance that he will ever be a free man again. Incidentally, this is called Paul's first imprisonment. Uh, about three or four years uh, after his release, or about what that begins, uh, four or six years after his release, he, uh, after he writes, he's, he's back in prison a second time in Rome and then will be executed uh, about a year later. So as Paul writes this letter to the Ephesians, he's in prison, uncertain about whether or not or, or when he will be freed, Considering the circumstances, I would not expect to see a joyous or, or cheerful attitude. And yet, that is what Paul has. As he writes this letter, he has a very positive attitude. Because in the midst of a very difficult situation, Paul has joy. We actually see this most clearly when he writes his letter to the Philippians. 
also composed during this time of imprisonment. Yet we do catch a glimpse of his attitude today as we look at Ephesians chapter 3. I didn't mention that's our text. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Uh, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. Or the words, again, will be on the screen. Ephesians 3, 1 through 13. We see that in the first verse of our text, where it says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. I think what's important here is of whom Paul says he is a prisoner. Now, it's obvious that it was the Romans who put Paul in that cell. It wasn't Jesus who did that. And yet, he identifies as Christ's prisoner. That's who I am. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He says that because he does not believe it is an accident that he's doing time at this time. He's not afraid of the Romans. He knows if God wanted, he could send angels and open the doors, just as he did for the apostle Peter in Acts chapter 12. Yet, for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ, God has Paul in prison. And Paul is confident God is going to work out his plan and, and I, I think he finds comfort and contentment in seeing himself as a prisoner of Jesus. I'm here because Jesus wants me to be here. That's also reflected in verse 13. Paul says, Then I ask you not to be discouraged over my afflictions on your behalf, for they are your glory. Now, catch that. It, it's not the Ephesians who are in prison. Paul, Paul is the one in prison, and yet he says, I, I don't want you to be discouraged. Even though I'm suffering for your sakes. And, and that reflects that Paul is not wallowing in, in self-pity. He, he, he's not worried about himself. He's concerned about the Ephesians. And, and, and he would not have that attitude if he did not have that confidence and joy in the Lord. Now, I hope this quick glimpse helps us see Paul's joy, despite adversity. And my point is that no matter how difficult life is right now for you, might be health problems, or family conflicts, financial difficulties, or maybe you're heading for prison tomorrow, I don't know. But no matter how difficult it is, it, it's possible to experience an underlying contentment or joy in life. Or as 2 Corinthians 6 tends, it's possible to be sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Now, I, I want to make clear that I, I'm not talking about the power of positive thinking, where you just kind of pretend everything is okay by, by thinking only positive thoughts. Uh, there's a story of three men who ended up in hell. The first was an atheist who kept saying, I can't believe this place really exists. I can't believe this place really exists. And the second was a, a proud, self-righteous fellow who kept saying, I can't believe I ended up here. I, I can't believe I ended up here. And the third was a positive thinker who kept saying, it's not hot here, it's not hot here, it's not hot here. Well, friends, that's obviously fictional, although there is some truth reflected, but, but it's an important point. Positive thinking has some severe limitations. Pretending life is okay when it really is not is not the answer. But Paul has a very different attitude based on reality. So the question is, why is Paul content? Why is he even joyful as he sits in prison? Well, there are a variety of reasons for that, I think, but our text highlights two on which we'll focus that contribute to uh, the joyful attitude that he had in the midst of affliction, which, again, the idea is we too can have this joyful attitude in the midst of affliction. The first is... 
the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel that Paul received from God. In verses 2 through 6, he uses the word mystery three times. First time in verse 3, the mystery was made known to me by revelation. Now, our English word mystery clearly comes from the Greek word that Paul uses, mysterion. Mystery, mysterion. Yet, yet Paul uses the term a, a bit differently than we usually do. To, to us, a, a mystery is usually something unknown. So I might say, it is a mystery where I left my phone. Meaning, I don't have a clue where it is. Yet, yet for Paul, a mystery is a truth that has been previously hidden, but now it's revealed. It's a secret that's no longer a secret. That happens maybe when you share some confidential information with a certain person, and all of a sudden it's no longer a secret. Well, well, this secret, verse 5, was not made known to people in other generations as it is now revealed to us, his holy apostles and the prophets, by the Spirit. And the apostles and prophets, of course, includes Paul. So he's now proclaiming was what once was a secret. Not a secret anymore, but it once was. But maybe you're thinking, well, Pastor Dan, what, what is this mystery of Christ not made known to previous generations? We've been talking about a couple times in recent weeks of how the entire Old Testament tells us about Christ. So how was the mystery not made known? Uh, for example, in, in Genesis 12, God tells Abraham, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through your descendant. Isaiah 53 tells us of the suffering servant who will save us from our sins. And Jesus implies that those who really pay attention to the Old Testament, if you read the Old Testament carefully, you will realize that he is the Messiah God promised. So what was the mystery really not known by the people in the Old Testament? Well, friend, whenever I read a, a mystery novel or, or watch uh, a television mystery, there are always clues about who done it. And if I pay close attention once in a while, I'll figure out, yeah, it was the maid, not the butler, who committed the murder. Yet, <laughs> frankly, it's usually not till the end <laughs> of the book or the end of the show, then I discover who the real killer is. Then the clues start to make sense. And in the same way, when Jesus comes to earth, lives, dies, and rises from the dead, that's when all the clues of the Old Testament make sense. That's when the mystery is revealed. That's when the identity of Messiah becomes clear. A second part of the mystery involves how God will provide salvation to Gentiles. First part was the mystery of, of who would be the Messiah. Now it's the how God will provide salvation to Gentiles. If you were a Jew in the first century, you believed that Gentiles could be saved. Yes, they could be saved if they would convert and follow all the Old Testament rules. If they would get circumcised. In other words, if they became a Jew, then they could be saved. However, as the mystery is revealed, it becomes clear that no, people don't need to become Jews. God will not save people through ritual and regulations of the Old Testament law. Rather, he is going to save people by grace, through faith in Jesus, in Jesus' death and resurrection. What specifically is the mystery? Verse 6, the Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and partners in the, promise, in the promise in Jesus Christ Jesus through the gospel. The great news that all who come to God in faith in Jesus will be saved, Jew and Gentile. This is kind of this, this double union we talked about a few weeks ago. Through faith in Jesus, Gentiles simply meaning non-Jews, 
have been brought into a relationship with God, united to him as our father. And because then of this relationship with God, we have also been united with God's people, with the Jews. As Christians, God is our father, and all other believers in Jesus are our brothers and sisters. The walls that had separated us from God have been taken down. The walls that separated us from each other have been taken down. And we are one family. It's great news. And Paul says, this is all the results of Jesus' death and resurrection in our place. Through the gospel, wonderful things have happened. And knowing this great news, knowing this revealed mystery, enables Paul to be joyful even when he is in prison. It enables him to be sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And it's truth that can help us, can help us find joy, even in our most difficult circumstances. When friends or family or finances or even favorite football team fail us, this glorious mystery can still bring joy to our lives. We can be sorrowful, yes, but always rejoicing. The second reason for Paul's contentment and joy is the ministry of the gospel to which God had called him. First we have the mystery of the gospel, now we have the ministry of the gospel. In other words, it's his job to communicate the mystery to others. Verse 7, I was made a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. <laughs> Paul sees this as a fantastic, almost unbelievable privilege. Verse 8, this grace was given to me, this gift was given to me, the least of all the saints, to proclaim to the Gentiles the immeasurable riches of Christ. To me, the least of all the saints. The NIV says, I am less than the least of all God's people. That would be the leastest. Uh, as someone who once persecuted Christians, Paul knows he does not deserve the privilege of representing Jesus Christ to others. And, and folks, Paul provides an important lesson to us. When it, when it comes to self-esteem and, and, and self-confidence, there is no question that, that Paul's life is characterized by joy and by confidence. <laughs> he is not afraid to look anyone in the eye. Any psychologist would say, well, Paul had very healthy self-esteem. And yet, Paul sometimes calls himself things like the least of all, or the chief of sinners. And, and those phrases on the surface seem to indicate a, a horrible self-image. And yet Paul had a very high view of who God had called him to be. Throughout the New Testament, he minimizes himself, but, but magnifies his ministry. Without Jesus, he says, I I'm the leastest. But with Jesus, I am the apostle God has chosen to the Gentiles. Paul, Paul would say, hey, with without Jesus, I was not okay. I was a mess. But with him, I am far more than just okay. And this view enables Paul to be both humble and confident. You know, often very confident people can be very egotistical. They, they believe they can do almost anything because they believe they're, they're pretty much better than anyone else. But the, the, the key to humble, joyful confidence is, is not a high view of self, but a clear view of who we are in Jesus. Paul is full not of self-confidence, but full of Christ-confidence. Well, some of you might be thinking, yeah, Pastor Dan, that, that sounds great, but, but I'm not anyone special. Paul, Paul was an apostle. 
you're a pastor. I, God hasn't called me to do anything important. <laughs> oh, yes, he has. Yes, he has, friend. God has called every single believer in Jesus to do something very important. He has, a, he has an assignment for each of us. Paul says he is called to preach the immeasurable riches of Christ, verse 9, and to shed light for all uh, about the administration of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. He seems to be getting a little wordy there, but it's clear what he means. He, like everyone in this room who's a believer in Jesus, we have that privilege to shed light or, or other versions say, to make plain. The, the, the term literally means to enable people to see. So in my vernacular, I would simply say, we have the opportunity to turn the light on for somebody so they can see who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and so that individual can become a disciple of Jesus. We can turn the light on for them. I think we have an opportunity to do that almost every day, to turn the light on for somebody. Oh, I, I suspect almost all of your friends and family members know something about Christianity, but many don't understand its message. It seems that so few really grasp that salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And many folks think that, well, yeah, you know, God's a good guy and, and he's only going to send the worst people to hell. And 90% of the folks out there think of themselves as, as a good person and assume if, there, if there's a heaven, I'll, I'll be there. When we explain that salvation is only by grace through faith in Jesus, <laughs> we're turning the light on for a lot of people. For a lot of pe people say that, Pastor, I've never thought about Salvation being by grace, not something I could earn. I remember someone telling me, um, you know, I was baptized a Catholic, and, and then I was baptized a Lutheran. I, I must be on good terms with a man upstairs. That, that fellow needed the light turned on. It, because the Bible makes it clear, it doesn't matter if you're baptized Catholic Lutheran, Presbyterian, Mormon, Baptist, it, it doesn't matter. If you're not trusting in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you have not experienced God's salvation. You're not in right standing with God. And friend, you as a Christian, if you're a believer in Jesus, you're called to help people realize, hey, there are immeasurable riches for all who turn to Jesus Christ. And when you're telling people that, you're not trying to sell them something they don't need. It's not like being an encyclopedia salesman. Because every human being needs Jesus Christ and the salvation only he can provide. They need the purpose. They need the forgiveness. They need the lo unconditional love. They need the hope in the face of death that only Jesus can give. And as a Christian, you're an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You are. If you were to become the president of the United States, that would be a step down from your role of being an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You know, you might wake up some mornings and wonder, you know, what difference would it make if I, if I don't get up today? Maybe you feel, hey, my, my role in life, it's, it's so insignificant. I, I really don't matter. But, but friend, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, you never, you never have a reason to feel that. Because no matter how many mistakes you have made, no matter how limited your gifts and abilities might seem, God has called you to turn on the light for some people around you. To represent him. And that's a high calling. 
It's an awesome privilege. And what, what Paul is saying, knowing this, knowing what a, a, an awesome calling you have, enables us to be content and joyful even when we're facing hard times. You, you might be going through really yucky conflict within your family. <laughs> Paul says you're sorrowful, but you're always rejoicing because you realize you still have that great privilege of being the ambassador of Jesus, being a peacemaker in this mess that surrounds you. Our unique privilege to understand and proclaim the mystery of Christ is underscored by Paul in verses 10 and 11. He says, this is so that the multifaceted wisdom, manifold wisdom, other versions say, may now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in, heaven, in the heavens. This is according to his eternal purpose accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. <laughs> uh, there's one phrase in there that's amazing. Not only is it our privilege to communicate God's grace to human beings, we also have the privilege to do it to angelic beings. Do I understand this? No, but I'm just going to tell you what Paul says. It, uh, some think the rulers and authorities refers to human governments, but the phrase in the heavenly realms makes it clear that, that Paul is not talking about senators and prime ministers. He's talking about outside of this world in that other dimension and he says the angels themselves are in awe over what God is doing in and through the church uh, musical some of you remember musical Cinderella the song which says impossible things are happening every day folks that that's not really true in the life we live down here, a lot of things are impossible. But in the heavenly realm, that's a true statement. Angels, both the good angels and the evil angels, see God doing impossible things in and through the church. Jews and Gentiles, are now reconciled to God and they're reconciled to each other. Enemies, people who couldn't stand each other, are now brothers and sisters. The events at the heart of the gospel, Jesus' incarnation, his life of perfect obedience, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, those events, those events will all put the angels in awe. That, that God could justly provide salvation freely to undeserving sinners. What The miracle of grace. That's amazing. John Newton wasn't the first to think that grace was amazing. Paul knew that. The angels know that. And as Christians, Paul says, we have a unique privilege, one which is the envy even of the angels. To experience that grace. And that's another reason that he's able to be content and joyful even when dark days come. Even when illness invades our body. Some of you are watching at home day because you're not feeling well. I know that. A lot of folks struggling with stuff. Even when you feel tired and weak and are in pain, even when you're sorrowful about that, you can still be rejoicing as you reflect on the unique privileges we have in Jesus. Phil Yancey notes that uh, the Bible contains some clues. He talks about 1 Corinthians 11. The head coverings for the sake of the angels, Revelation chapter 12, that, that whole chapter, that indicate even our seemingly insignificant actions here on earth might have some pretty amazing significance in the heavenly realm. And he speculates that 
whenever any Christian chooses to trust and obey Jesus in, in just the, the smallest way, especially if we make that choice in the face of adversity, that causes the good angels to celebrate and the evil angels to scream in anguish. Yancey says this means that we should not be discouraged by the seemingly mundane days that fill our lives. Because we may not see the impact our lives are having here and now, but there might be a lot more impact in eternity. Friends, as Paul is imprisoned, thinking of the marvelous mystery which has been revealed in Jesus, thinking of the magnificent ministry uh, to which God has called him to communicate that, that message to others, thinking of how even the angels are in awe of what God is doing in his life. <laughs> oh, he finds that encouraging. He finds the grace of God overwhelming. <laughs> he has a reason for joy, even in, in very difficult circumstances. And he can be sorrowful, but still rejoicing. And folks, that isn't, that isn't just the Apostle Paul. That's been the experience of many Christians, including some of you in this room. Uh, I thought of someone who lived quite a while ago, uh, William Carey, the great Baptist missionary to India in the, in the early 1800s. He went to India, and he, he would work 10 hours a day in a factory in order to make money to pay his expenses. And then, after he got done with, with work, he would labor late into the night, translating the Bible into Hindi, the language spoken in India. And all the while he was doing that, he was caring for his wife in the next room who suffered from severe mental illness. And as many of you know, India is a pretty hot and humid place. The early 1800s, there's no air conditioning. There's, there's no electric fans even. The filth and smells were sometimes overwhelming, but his co-workers, numerous co-workers said, Kerry cheerfully went about his work every single day. Cheerfully. Though he encountered obstacle after obstacle, he was seldom discouraged. One time, all of his translation notes were destroyed in the fire. Years of work wiped out in minutes. And yet he continued to joyfully persevere because like Paul, he understood that the mystery and ministry of the gospel were reasons for joy, no matter what his circumstances were. Well, friend, I guess the question is, do you realize that the gospel of Jesus Christ gives you a reason for joy even when life is difficult? You know, compared to so many at other times in history and in other parts of, uh, of our world, most of us have rather easy circumstances, but there certainly are hard times that come to our lives. And our text makes it clear there's no reason we cannot be content and joyful even when life is tough. If you're a Christian, there's, you can still be content and joyful even when life is tough. Now, the answer is not to feel guilty or, or beat yourself up because of your grumbling and complaining and lack of joy. That's, that's not the right answer. Rather, I suggest that you commit yourself to increasing your knowledge and appreciation of the marvelous mystery and magnificent ministry of the gospel. Because when you realize what God has done for you, is doing for you, will do for you through Jesus, uh, realizing what he wants to do through you, there's every reason to be content and joyful today and in the days ahead. Uh, my mother um, recently had surgery, had her gallbladder out. Uh, she suffers from dementia, and if she listens to this uh, uh, on the Internet, and doesn't like that I'm talking about her, she'll forget about it the next time I talk to her, so it's no big deal. But anyway, she's in the hospital, and uh, the doctor tells my brother, yeah, your mother's here. She's not quite sure where she is. She thought she was in California because she saw Lake Michigan out the window. Um, 
But he says, your mom is very content, and he's, she's very witty. Somehow she does that, even without understanding a lot what's going on. She's very content and very witty. And my, my dear cousin said, oh, may God grant us the grace to always be content and witty in our afflictions. By the grace of God, be content and witty, even in your afflictions. Amen.